here. You have piqued my interest. I want to see this strategy. We are going to hop into the game. It is game one of the series in the Arcway. Four minutes. <laughs> Where on earth are we going to make it up? We're going to look at these compositions that are coming out from Skyline D. Skyline D, a little bit expected, but a little bit more standard on the side of Shell's Angels. Uh, am I seeing 40 DPS? Oh, wow. I said more standard. I just assumed that the Druid was healing. Uh, <laughs> I, I, from what we see, we see a you know, nice 40 DPS build coming out of here by Skyline D here uh, as Mayu going into... <laughs> Go to the DPS spec. It's very interesting to be Man, able to you're see. Shook. On the, I am a little bit shook. I, I gotta tell you, right? Uh, on the side of Shell's Angels, we're going to, the, of course, the double Wind Walker, uh, and of course, the Boomkin still going out there. Let's <laughs> set the stage here. We got one team that said that they can clear this entire dungeon in 15 minutes, which is just about four minutes faster than we've seen anyone else do it. May, five, maybe six. And then we have another squad pulling right now with four DPS. You cannot ask for a better series here. Skyline D versus Shell's Angels in the upper portion of the bracket. I never would have thought that we had been able to see a four DPS <laughs> composition. I mean, if any continent would have it, it would be China. But I never thought that we'd be seeing four DPS, no healer going into the MDI land. Uh, on the land, right? I mean, we saw it uh, in a few fringe scenarios. Obviously, to get to this point, when we talk about how teams actually qualified, we know that a few of them did actually experiment with playing four DPS. But ultimately, when you get here, mistakes can just throw you off so far. And consistency is so important. And you need to run this for all three. Well, the scariest part about it is, like you said, the consistency, any mistakes and things like that. But let's just, for, for argument's sake, let's say they play perfectly. Let's say that they have all these advantages. The amount of leech gear or, you know, the self-regen type gear, defensive, legendaries, things like that that you have to run, hurts your damage so much that if, you know, Mayu isn't even playing on the top of his game uh, on his off-spec as balance or something like that, is it really going to be worth that much more? Especially because Sierra has already shown us from Shell's Angels just how much damage he's able to pump out here. Oh, we already see that perk going to be used. Reigns going right into popping that. Now he's not going to have that lifeline. If he gets taken down next time, he will die. Mayu going to be low as well, and I feel like this the portals is be are open now. Yeah, we're seeing the portals open, and we are seeing people yo-yo. We're going to see the tank die. This may be the first wipe coming in from a very risky play coming in from Skyline D. So let's shift our attention over to Shell's Angels, see what they're doing. Are they doing anything out of the box yet, Jack, in your mind? This is a, a potential skip that we've seen quite a few times. He's getting right up here on the top of the staircase. Yeah, he's looking like he's going to be uh, trying to make that kind of disengaged jump to be able to kind of get ahead. Uh, I'm not not certain if he's going to be able to 100% to make it. Be interesting to be able to see if he's going to be able to flap and get the disengage off. He does get it. There you go. Beautiful. And then he's going to be able to more quickly get the res up on Syrah. It could be kind of complicated if you're going to be having it on the side of like the Holy Paladin running ahead, kind of skipping ahead here. A lot of times Rest of Druid is just where it's at in terms of being able to easily skip ahead. So great play there by the Boomkin to make sure he's able to get on top, be able to get that skip going. And it's something that you really don't see enough of and the people haven't really practiced enough on live servers to really get a good uh, view of it. Skip is super important. And obviously, they are going to incur a little bit of that death penalty, so it has to be worth the seconds that they're taxing themselves with, as you already can see on that death counter. But Skyline D already gotten quite a few deaths. Going to be pulling the call right here, right now. Opt into using that heroism. And we can see, once again, everybody getting chunked down for just a second, but Sierra going to be able to top them back off. Yeah, you love what you'll be able to see when you're having a very risky pull, a very aggressive pull going into it. You are seeing Sierra going down. They get the immediate battle res off onto him. Very big dot going out on Shell right there, making sure he's popping into bear form, starts the Frenzy Regen, start getting himself topped off here very rapidly. Again, the dot goes out onto him, so it's nice you're having a bit of a more tanky target as he's just kind of chilling out in bear form here, making life easier for Syrah if possible. You might see Bubble come out for Syrah here because he's, oh, so much damage is going out. You're seeing both of them going down, and this is really the disaster scenario where they haven't really killed a whole lot just yet during this Bloodlust phase, and at this point, they just have to kill the Fellblade and then see what they can do, but at this point, 77% on the die. boss, I just don't think they're going to be able to do the full fight. Stack and die seems like it may be the method. They're still staying alive here for a little bit longer. We're going to have to see if those monks can do it. Ultimately, Skyline D has been able to get the skip, it looks like, as well, potentially. So that could be something that's big for them. Actually, they are split up at this point. Skyline D, though, needs to regroup here, but they got a window. A wipe comes in for Shell's Angels as well. This is not looking like that 15-minute run at this point. Yeah, one of the scariest things when you're going into these very aggressive poles where everything's kind of on the line, as a healer, you have to be able to pump out as much damage as possible to start neutralizing the threat. But once your wings falls off, once your Holy Avenger falls off, you're, I guess, basically leaning on your Devotion Aura to kind of leave people alive. And as they're kind of waiting for their uh, failure detection pylons cooldown to kind of reset here because they did have all those other deaths previously, at this point, they're kind of just 
getting themselves reset and try to take care of it. And thankfully, they got all the trash done. But as a healer, it's very scary when you're having to make those decisions between targets you want to be priority healing, when people are, are able to rely on their own defensives. And that's kind of just where it ended up, where Shell didn't quite have the defensives left to him. And Zero seemed to be focusing just a little bit too much on damage to be able to keep him and uh, Shell alive at the same time. Now, we are going to see, though, the, the thing that happens with Shells is Heroism, which is obviously a huge cooldown. They're not going to have it. They didn't really get to utilize in the first place. Skyline D, on the other hand, kind of does get to utilize it because they used it a little bit earlier on when they were actually working on trash. So they still at least got the uptime there. And now they're going to be ahead as far as the death department is going to be concerned. And Zakal going to be engaged once again by Shell's Angels. They have to regain here. We talked about the fact that there wasn't much utility left last time that they actually did pull it here. Do you expect to see any problems coming out from them this time? At this point, I mean, they just now pulling the boss. They're getting the 60% so rapidly. Sierra pu putting out incredible amounts of damage here. At this point, I think that they've kind of learned you know, where they need to be playing you know, a little bit more safely. But at this point, they've already killed the most lethal part of it, which was all that trash going uh, into the fight. So they're a lot of the priority healing to it is taken away. A lot of the extra threats are taken away to it, and they're looking to be in a much more favorable position. And even still, their strategy has been good. Just having that wipe, and because the checkpoint is all the way back at the start of the instance um, until they kill a boss, you know, it, it puts them in such a scary scenario of you must kill this, you must be getting past this point, otherwise you're in such a horrible position. And they've done a great job being able to salvage that. This is always kind of one of those dungeons, too, where the checkpoint can be one of the most devastating things ever. We we have started to see this path be one of the more favored paths, actually going for that skip, going for Zakal first. But we're looking for something that we haven't seen before, honestly, out of Shell's Angels. The question is, when will we see that? I'm assuming that they have some strategy that is very different when they start to talk about having one of the fastest times that we've ever seen. Even though we do see that wipe come in, we haven't seen that yet. We just saw the basic strategy so far. We see that little bit of a hiccup, but I don't think that we've seen everything that Shell's Angels has to offer as they start to move back through the dungeon now. It's a call on the other end, still going to be at 50% for Skyline D, but they have closed in on the gap after their hiccup. It was interesting to see if you want to look at the damage here. You're seeing Sierra has the damage meters just reset. He was at 1.4 million uh, DPS on Zakal here. You're seeing about the same damage going out on the side of Mayu here. Going into DPS deck, you're offering very little in terms of off healing abilities. You're very much putting everybody else in a bad position because they have to be playing with more defensive legendaries more often than not. Whereas Shell's Angels, Double Windwalker, they can play as aggressively as they need to and lean on their healer you know, when they absolutely have to, right? Well, the, the Moonkin's also not going to put out the craziest single target DPS. The Moonkin's really going to shine when it has a chance to ramp up on some of these AoE pulls. But let's take a look at Nultiri here. we got to talk about a few of the mechanics that are going to be slung by this boss. Yeah, but right here you're seeing the Tangle Web that was just going out. You're seeing both monks uh, making sure they're pl placing down their transcendence into different areas. Tangle Web will grab two targets, push them together, and they have to basically split the chain as they take ticking damage. So having an instant transcendence or a blink out of on the side of Shell makes it a lot easier to be able to instantly break those chains, reduce the damage taken, and allow Sierra to kind of get back onto the boss. And now Tira may just fall before Skyline D even makes it over to his second boss. Only five seconds behind is going to be Shell's Angels because of the death that they've incurred. But right now, it's just looking like smooth sailing on this boss. And you are going to see massive damage coming out from these monks. They really have been the key here. And you talk about the fact that they have free reign. They just get to DPS. They don't have to worry about not having a healer. And you can see right now, going incredibly offensive here, even in light of getting chunked on. We see both of them dipping a little bit low, but they have the healer to work with. They don't have to worry about much. Now you actually see defensive cooldowns coming out from them, and ultimately here it is going to be on Sira who's taking the most damage, maybe puts out a defensive utility, but this is just looking so much easier for them than that 4 DPS comp. Yeah, and just by running a Holy Paladin who can play hyper-aggressively, you're able to make up al almost as much or probably even more damage than bringing a fourth DPS while still making things safer, while allowing your DPSers to not have to run defensive legendaries and reduce their own DPS here. So it, it kind of seems like Skyline D in many ways just hasn't really learned from Team No Healer in their own region. Hey, uh, I'm going to be honest. You know me, Jack. I, I want to <laughs> see the four DPS come yeah, out as many times as possible. Could. <laughs> uh, yeah, 100%. No disc. Not ever. But here, I definitely do see your points, and I do agree with it. It looks a little bit better on the side of Naltira, though. We are actually going to see the Moonkin doing a bit more damage than it did previously, but already Shell's Angels going to be moving over to their third boss, trying to get it down here. And we do know with the mobility that monks have, you can really utilize the mechanics. You can stack that haste buff incredibly high. Yeah, not only that, but also 
when you're pulling the trash, you have those little haste bubbles that are available to you. So it's not even like you actually have to pop Bloodlust for a pack that basically gives you Bloodlust provided, right? You're able to ev get everybody into those packs. You're able to actually run out and get any of the extra fields to further increase your haste if need be. But at this point, you know, just as they're going to be able to start picking up some uh, circles on the ground, all the trash has been annihilated and Voss is closing in on 50%. I, I mean, look how much damage they were able to get out. I mean, that is 23 million damage. I think it spiked at something like 27 million damage, maybe even yeah. in the 30s for their monk. You can do a lot with this fight, and they're basically just speeding through it. And this is also running down the timer for them to actually get that heroism back off cooldown, to get that lust. Excuse me, everybody in chat is probably <laughs> making fun of me for being a filthy alliance player, which I'm not even anymore. But ultimately, they are going to have it back when they get into more troublesome waters. So the fact that they have that hiccup and they don't get to use that heroism and keep the uptime, it's looking like less of a problem now. It definitely does, and it looks like they're just going to be having one more Bloodlust stuff available for them. But, you know, Rich, there is that character services discount going on, so if you wanted to go back to Alliance, you know, now's the time, right? I kind of want to. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'll never forgive you, though, but... <laughs> Wait, we, we can talk about this later because okay. Corsal Axe is about to fall for Shell's Angels. And you can see here, they pretty much are just going to be getting a run around. It is going to be the Moonkin here ultimately grabbing a bunch of those haste buffs. And you can see keeping up here very well with that Windwalker Monk. Just 15% left while Skyline D getting to the room now. And we have to see if they go for the same pull. We already saw how effective it really was on the side of Shell's Angels. Once again, you can pull everything, get those haste buffs. Not only are you going to have the haste to deal with the adds, but you're going to have all that additional damage onto the boss. They're going to be popping heroism as well. And you also, you have to know, this is a particularly bursty pool with this damage composition. With those demon hunters, you're obviously going to be able to go ham. It's I-beam city, mean beams, just have a field day. You're going to be resetting it. I'm assuming that they're going to be running the helmet at this point. And then also with the Moonkin, this is a scenario where the Moonkin is really going to shine. And you have a rogue, but we see a death come in on Skyline D's side when they're in that heroism, when they go for that big pull, and it's going to be on the Moonkin. Yeah, you see Mayu going down here, right? As Shell's Angels is pulling everything leading up to the third boss coming up here. They're getting the, you know, the nice line of sight. They're able to take care of all the warp shades really well. Mass Grip going down. And really, the affixes we haven't even talked about too much because they've done such a great job of being able to counter them. Having the fortified Raging Volcanic really is extremely light and easy to deal with a lot of times when you're just able to nuke everything down, get it all in together. You are seeing a shine going down. Divine is just dropping so low. He needs to just get himself topped off. Ooh. Was not able to actually get out of Purgatory. So they are having to deal with the phase breach casts which are going out and actually will result in the wipe but they got so much done already out of it they definitely did and i was about to commend them before the wipe came in and this yeah. may have been one of the areas where they did really make up a lot of time because you have to say when you have the ability to drop down that solar beam like that the way that they're able to keep everything clumped up based off the line of sight then using the grip a little bit later you basically get a blanket silence for the entirety of that pool it was very well executed by shell's angels but even there you can see there's a little bit of danger on this key difficulty i think a lot of it was actually shine going down and not having enough dps because if you're looking at how low all those uh mobs actually ended up being it looks like they just were would have been able to actually get everything down if they didn't kind of run out of time when losing one of their dpsers it's one of those things where ultimately you look over on the side of Shell's Angels and they're so close to having this dungeon so perfect but those tiny microscopic seconds just put them in a place where all of a sudden their really phenomenal strat isn't executed well enough and they're put in a place where they're losing time because of it instead of gaining enormous amounts of time. Yeah, and I, I think this dungeon really shows the threat that is Shell's Angels is that a lot of these pulls have just been kind of balanced on a razor's edge. There's been very small things that if, oh, if Shine didn't die or if we didn't have Sira and Shell going down on the call side, for example, you know, they would have been able to complete the pull and actually gain massive advantages. So I, in many ways, I think that their strategy, their uh, touted like 15, 16 minute arcway isn't so much uh, of the fact that it's always going to be mega consistent, they have the perfect execution. It's just that they have these hyper aggressive strategies that are that will work more likely than not, and enough for them to actually compete with it. How scary is a team right now? If you are any other team competing in this tournament, where you look at them and when they make mistakes, you're still terrified of them because that's ultimately what we are starting to see from Shell's Angels. Now, I want to note on the side of Skyline D, the really scary thing that we saw was the fact that they went for that entire boss fight while having that DPS down.
they're able to get the boss down, but you're in a situation where you just are at such a huge deficit the entire time. Yes, they still do have three DPS, but they've already invested so much to run a four DPS composition at that point, and it is going to cost them dearly now. They need to get back on over to Ivanir to try to catch up with Shell's Angels. Shell's Angels going to have their bloodlust back. Got it that time, as they have already gotten Ivanir down to 77%. And not only are they, you know, popping Bloodlust and just wrapping up as we speak, we also saw them drop in some nice equilateral triangles here, making sure that they're getting rid of those. And of course, important to note, you will be having the, the unstable magic going out that was dealing tons of damage. It's dropping everybody very low. Important for those three players to make sure that they spread out, drop those, then you're having the Nether Lake coming out here, where it's very important to make sure that you're dropping these three points kind of right on top of each other. A very nice tracing job here by Shell's Angels, dropping all those Void Zones on top of each other other getting them out of the way of the rest of the group but also having very good positioning because if any other linked up player starts moving they start pushing you back and can easily push you back into the void zone very nice equilateral triangles coming out there but jack i i prefer mine acute <laughs> oh you're cute all right, back to the dungeon. Even <laughs> you're going to be dropping to 44%. And ultimately, the placement has been absolutely flawless by Shell's Angels. Two equilateral triangles, if you will. And they are cruising at this point, even with those mistakes. Do you think that those risks at this point, you can say, were very worth it? Yeah, absolutely. And without a doubt that they are showing that they're going to be worth it. And while they are a much more polished team than we're seeing on the side of Skyline D in terms of like how they're setting up the polls, how they plan their strategies, a lot of times they are just playing all in. And a lot of times when we've been able to, to talk to other players, they've said, yeah, we're, we're worried. What we're most worried about is actually playing too safe and too secure and, and actually losing out uh, on some of the benefits of playing these hyper-aggressive compositions. So we're going to put everything we have onto the table and execute the strategies that are going to be most likely to work instead of the things that are always going to be guaranteed. And a thing that you may not be thinking about at home that I really do want you to kind of just put in your mind for a second here, it's going to be different for these teams like Shell's Angels that are here now and not on their home setup. They don't really have a way besides maybe a team celebrating on the stage next to them to kind of keep track to say, okay, let's speed up, let's slow down, let's go for safer pulls, let's go for bigger pulls. Here, they're more reliant on themselves and Shell's Angels ultimately, who are they looking at on the stage? You are going to see that split because the fact that our teams from China aren't here. So ultimately, it's all them. There is an unknown. They want to be going fast. So I think seeing these big pulls really does go for a lot. But jumping back on board with them, another very nice pull. They're going to be able to uh, group it up nicely, get that silence down. But Divine Field going to be in a situation where he doesn't have the purgatory yet again. Yeah, and just how aggressively you're making these pulls in the setup. You know, a lot of times you're seeing Divine kind of leaning on Busted Protection to be able to make sure that you're going to be getting everything in together. I don't think they really wanted to get this spirit at all. I think they should have more than enough trash percentage right here. Yeah. So they should have more than enough trash percentage, so they really didn't want to actually end up pulling the ghost that's coming out here. And they have to always worry about not only the increasing damage of the torment, but also the damage that it will go out from uh, the raging effect that it will be happening once they hit 30%. Hey, it's it's tough based off of all the mechanics, and it's tough because it's a giant baddie with a giant health bar that can't be efficient any way that you toss the dice. They're still standing here just dealing with one mob that they don't even need. Shell's Angels definitely don't want to have to deal with that at all. And now Skyline D, is that going to be enough of a window? Hell no. It's just not going to be enough of a window. They really do need Shell's Angels at this point to get another wipe. Where are those moments where a wipe could even come in as your mind as a healer? At this point, I mean, you really have to have some strong misplays when you're going to uh, the last boss here, going on to Vondros, right? It, at that point, it's just playing, in fact, just making real stupid mistakes or anything like that. A lot of their wipes thus far have been just maybe on a razor's edge where it's one person kind of going down or one little mistake here or there, maybe a, a mistake in priority and what the healer maybe wanted to do instead of he instead of DPSing, just putting in a little bit of extra healing out. But at this point with Vondros, it has to be just full misplays and it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a huge wall for Skyline D. I, I feel like that's actually a lesson that I've taught you. Oh, really? Th there are different types of mistakes. That's right. There are mistakes that are from coming from these risky plays, right? It does come down to those tiny little miscalculations, but they're worth it. Those are Those mistakes come from a conscious decision, and then there are just stupid mistakes. Or rich mistakes. We call them rich <laughs> mistakes. That, that is 100% correct. And ultimately, you need rich mistakes here if you want to come out on top. You need Shell's Angels to be making rich mistakes because here they have gotten themselves in a place where stupid mistakes are going to be the only thing that we cost them. And 
I got to say, I haven't seen them make any stupid mistakes. It was going for these really big plays. It was going for ambitious looks, going for speedy times. And now we see that they're five minutes off from what they said they may be able to do as we start to pass that 20-minute mark. But I'm impressed by Shell's Angels. Yeah, it really shows how lethal they can be, as we have already seen a number of polls and a number of instances in general where they've been able to actually been, be very successful they've been able to take on you know the most dangerous trash backs and been able to succeed with it so at this point you know they are just wrapping up the rest of the boss they're going to be having to take this you know this consistent route that uh, everybody is always going to have to go down to it so there's not going to be too much rng they have to worry about for that and skyline d just does have such a large deficit but i think at this point in time like while you're right they don't actually have uh, the ability to see you know what their opponents are doing they got to be start thinking about the next game saying all right where are the personal errors where are the light mistakes that we made that we really need to be able to fix up and capitalize on and get out of the way before we actually go into game two yeah, I was going to see, can, they can double in cap, right? Oh, so they're not actually going to use it there because they do have the two monks. I wasn't sure if they were going to try to go for a double paralysis. He wasn't able to get like a good enough line of sight onto it. Okay, yeah, so that is one thing that they are afforded by the comp that actually speeds it up a considerable amount. I mean, you look at the composition overall, and you got a pack of speed demons. You just have very mobile DPS all around, so they can move through that phase a little bit faster, even then, uh, obviously, on the side of Skyline D, you, you got those demon hunters. They're going to be pretty quick as well. Just something to note there. The in caps do look pretty nice. They get one of them off. They don't get off the second. That's going to give them more seconds as they get over onto Vandros. He's dropping below that 25% mark here. It looks like Shell's Angels should be able to close out the first map. Yeah, but I love what they're doing out of Shell's Angels, making sure they're kiting away from any of these arcane bombs that are coming out that will be exploding after a short time. And you also will be having the knockback that's going to be coming up that you have to just push back against. You've seen Sierra, of course, popping his bubble, there's the damage of, along the way by using Devotion Aura coming up with it. So very good mechanics to make sure the entire group is really moving together, staying away from any of the bombs that will be uh, detonating over time here. 2% left on Vandros as going down. Shell's Angels... Had some mistakes here, but I think they got away with a good win. I mean, they still beat them by more than a boss, that's right? True. I, I, there there was 2%. The boss just got pulled on the side of Skyline D. So that's about as dominant of a performance that we can expect to see from Shell's Angels. Imagine if they were able to make here. All right, Shell's Angels just needs to win this map. And if they do, they are going to BlizzCon. They are going to the MDI All-Stars in November. Gentlemen, take it away. A lot at stake even early on. Obviously, we're not going to be sending any teams home, but you kind of learn their fate. You know that they kind of hit that first goal. Obviously, you want to win the whole thing, but you want to be in those top teams. You want to make it to that all-star match, but this isn't the easiest map to do it on. I would love to have a Warlock or something like that, so you can maybe get a little bit of kiting on, something like that, but here, we're going to see all these teams just running straight at that trash. We're going to need to see clean CC blankets come out. Yeah, at this point, you're, you're watching as they're moving. Uh, for example, Harrow just getting out of the group. I believe he actually had the double uh, lightning strike onto him, so it was a huge amount of damage going out as he just made sure he got out of the group, gets the dispel, and then is able to move on from there. But at this point, you are seeing Skyline D's tank on range, just making sure he's kiting back, he's running away, making sure those Thunder Callers are not going to be casting onto them as, they, as the team burns them down. But right from the get-go, Shell's Angels just absolutely annihilated this trash. Divine Shield never had to end up running away, and they're moving right into him along the offset. That's typically a, a pool where you do see teams run away as well. It, it is a scary pool, and it, Shell's Angels makes it look like it's not that difficult. Obviously, it is going to be the bosses that we need to be scared of here, not the trash. We are in the plus 24, but it is going to be the bosses that are buffed by our affixes now. Already pulled is going to be Himdal. First thing you got to know, it's not going to be a boss that they need to get all the way down to zero percent but they deal with this first mechanic beautifully getting it back over out of that void zone yeah they're making sure that they're you're calling out watching out for any of the storm drakes coming out which will be just uh aoeing one lane always gonna make sure they're moving correctly for that and since they only have one ranged in doru there he's just making sure he's baiting out any of the whirling blades just away from the rest of the group here and you are gonna have it on the side of mayu doing the same for skyline d because of course sira as a holy paladin is counted as melee so he never will be having that cast onto him and at that point you're just making sure people are playing defense enough to be able to survive the horn blast and then calling out where you need to run for each lane and that is exactly what we are seeing right now but we're also seeing a relatively close race here the thing is, is we keep up on this clip this is going to be one of those dungeons where just slowly we see shells angels pull ahead just a little bit cleaner on the trash and the entire time they're getting closer to him doll for skyline d you see the tank run away it's going to take them longer to get to that objective especially when you are on a death knight and what you got wraith walk to get back it is going to take a little bit of extra time to actually have those movement moving away from the objective can cost seconds yeah and 
at this point, I mean, it's very early on, but it, it, every second is going to count. We've seen some incredibly close games uh, just today already here as we're going to, as we're moving from 23s to 24s. We are seeing how quickly everybody can be dropping down here, but the DPS difference staying about 10% here. Looks like Skyline D might be just catching up just a tad on it, but they oh. still are going to have a long way to go. They are having Sierra going down, and this has kind of been one of the things I do want to point out is Sierra's ha had a bunch of early deaths, which have been a little bit needless here, and it's scary to actually have it put in situations, not just dying, but dying in, in an unfavorable situations where they need to consume the battle res in order to keep on going. Well, th that's such a costly one. I, I'm about to, I was about to gas up Shell's Angels, right? They have those little micro things with the trash pool that gets them seconds. Then they get onto the boss, and we see that they're widening the gap a little bit. They're actually putting out more DPS all around. So you go, okay, look, they're doing a fantastic job of actually widening that gap just a little bit. But now they pretty much almost wipe that gap away. We're going to see when we actually have him dog go down those five seconds may have just erased all of that a needless death cannot happen yeah and it, it also highlights some of the areas where you're really going to be needing battle reses in the future i mean uh, assuming that they're going to be going into for example here's right if they're going to go into here's with no battle res left available is that going to be a conversation that they're having right now saying well do we really want to be able to do this or are we, gonna, are we going to be confident to do this without bloodlust this is something that we saw out of method na for example where they did at least have one battle res left uh, to them, but they going into here's you're dealing with three storms on tyrannical with no bloodlust is not extremely risky to them. So I'm interested in seeing what they're going to be going on from here. The woes may not be over. Essentially, you already can see that five second deficit. The the slowdown is going to be into effect for Shell's Angels. But like Jack said, it may not be over. They already invested one of those battle reses. That's not something you can afford to give up. Now, we are going to see this time around, Tank going to have to move away. What makes this trash pack so scary for them that this time they're opting into going for that? At that point, you want to make sure that you're getting away from any of the Mystic, for example, the Mystic Healing, as you're seeing Marco Skull right in the middle of the melee there, but also being able to quickly neutralize the Thundercallers. Uh, whenever you're having the tank running away from the Thundercallers, they need to actually be in range of the tank in order to actually in order to put out any of the stuns that they are. So when you're such heavy melee, melee composition, you want to make sure you're getting the maximum uptime. You're not having people uh, spawning into it. So Divine's doing a great job being able to move out of that. But it's also kind of, as you're seeing, a couple of the mystic uh, healing circles that are coming out, prolonging this pull a little bit longer than you'd like to see, but they do still have a bit of a lead over Skyline D. We also saw Shell's Angels a few times. Those explosives looked a little bit scary for them. You could see them getting very close to going off. Now they're going to be moving into the room. There is potential for a pretty large pull here, and you can see just pulling everything on the way over to... Uh, so I, they might... I'm assuming that now that pretty much says what their path is going to be. Do, for you, does that telegraph it pretty clearly, or do you think they're just clearing out the room now? Uh, not necessarily. You're able to take a couple different options, take a diff couple different routes, depending on how your damage is looking. I think it leans more towards uh, going to Fenrir at first, but there is so much trash into this. If it was going to be in a fortified situation, it would take you a considerable amount of time to clear out the entire hall here, and then you'd be able to go on to Hirja with Bloodlust available. But because we're not in a fortified situation, it does uh, lend it a little bit more towards going on to Fenrir just for the safety sake. It's, it's interesting though because I really thought that going for Fenrir first wasn't going to be a strategy that we did see. Obviously there are upsides to going for Fenrir first as you already did know based off the timings of big cooldowns like the last based off the difficulties of the boss but going for Fenrir first do you feel like there are a few things that could definitely slow down a team? Uh, I think that they've already been slowed down a number of times with these Mystic Pools that keep coming out. Not really having much, well, not really taking great advantage of displacement uh, in terms of uh, pushing mobs away with Typhoon or maybe even using a Ring of Peace or anything like that. They haven't done a great job to be able to make sure that either those casts don't go off to begin with or they're quickly um, knocking those ads just out of the way here. Looks like uh, Divine Feely is just moving on towards the Fenrir side, so they will be opting to go with that. I think it's definitely the right move when they don't have any battle res left available to them. Uh, even in one of the most clean Halls of Valor Hirsches that we've seen at a Method NA, we still got into a situation where we had JV going down because he was the target of the Arcane yeah. Light after a storm, and he had basically had the option of swift mending himself, not going into bear form, or going into bear form and hoping he had enough HP. So his overkill was ridiculously small, but because he wasn't perfectly topped off, they had to burn the battle res in order to keep on going. And dealing with three storms with no bloodlust is just a, is, you're just asking for it all. Shells is now in a less than ideal situation, to say the least, but they're going for the high 
high percentage play here. They're going to go ahead and pull Fenrir first. They're going to try to get those battle reses off. We know how scary it definitely could be. Skyline D, though, they're going to be able to make their way on over to Herja first. So we see two different teams taking two different paths. Now they're going to be pulling those mini bosses before they actually do get into the boss. And those mini bosses will give you pretty good insight into the mechanics that you're going to see when Herja actually does get pulled. And yeah, you're seeing, of course, the first storm going out. You are having a bubble that will be reducing the damage you're taking into that. And then it's followed up by the other side, which will be putting out the Sanctifies, which are small little orbs that are going to be coming out, which will deal pulsing AoE damage to the, enti to the entire group if one individual hits them. So a lot of times you will see they'll take the, uh, the Storm add, make sure the Storm pops up, then they'll pull the Sanctify mob over to it. So that way you're going to actually have Kind of, kind of a desync with them. So, like, right as Sanctify ends, the storm begins. Right as storm ends, Sanctify begins. You're able to steadily pull yourself away from the Sanctify every single time without actually hurting your three melee DPS. Deal with the storm. Don't get hit by the fidget spinners. On the other end, Shell's Angel's going to have Fenrir down to 70% already, and he's going to go into that phase where he does lick his wound soon, and then they are going to have to move on over and finish off this boss. Yep. Yeah, and at this point, you know, all they have to do is take care of the last the Sanctify had it add as uh, Shell's Angel's is working on towards Fenrir. It's still an extreme risk uh, having to deal with uh, Hirsha without Bloodlust available to you. I think it probably is the faster of the strategies that, uh, that you could take, but it is extremely risky, and you have to have a lot of faith in your composition and making no mistakes, because again, just like Zakal, it's kind of that crossroads point where if you actually fail there, it sets you back so much farther, especially if you're using battle reses or bloodlust in the process. That's why Shell's Angels didn't do it. I think you want to go for that Herja play, but I like that from Skyline D because now if they do get it, it's the risky move for them. They saw that they got blown out of the water in the first series. Now they're going to go into this. They're going to go with something that's a little bit more aggressive. If we see them get past Herja, all of a sudden, I really start to think maybe this is a team that can bring it down. Now on the side of Shell's Angels, they're back onto the second side for Fenrir. They're going to have these ads to deal with, and this is when you love to have the laser chicken. Going to be able to get out massive amounts of AoE damage here while still getting good damage on to Fenrir. Fenrir dipping below 50% at this point. You can see it is going to be the Moonkin that gets chunked. There's so many things that you can do as a Moonkin to stay up there, but that damage still does get scary. Yeah, I was really surprised. Uh, maybe there was a, they just didn't have less protection, or he tried to use Hand of Sacrifice, but the damage just ended up being too high. But I'm very surprised to see the death there uh, by Shell. But uh, at the same time, you have a Battle Res coming out in seconds, really, Are you, and you're at 40% left here on Fender. You use the Battle Res here, you're not going to have it available for Hirsha at this point. If you actually sit on that Battle Res, then you're going to be sitting onto a Battle Res for 40% of a boss's HP, and in a tyrannical setting, that just spells disaster for you. It sets you f so far back. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. That's the main thing. The entire reason they went to this boss is because they assume they won't see a death. Now, keep in mind, Skyline D is already going to be working on Herja. I, I want to note, though, for Shell's Angels, once again, they decide to leave down their Moonkin, who I didn't even see if he made it into bear form in time or anything like that, but we are going to see Fenrir now at 30%. That's only 10% since he died. This is slowing them down considerably, but they will have that battle res, which they were trying to get for Herja when they make it over to this side. Will this slow them down enough? They're already slowed down because they went for Fenrir first. The pressure point going to be Skyline D. If they can take Herja down here as they deal with this first storm, they potentially put themselves in the lead. Yeah, at this point, you're really just trying to see you know, how Mayu will be best able to kind of deal with all of the, the damage that will be going out during the storm here because you'll be able to take Germ, you'll be able to take Flourish, Cultivation, be able to quickly top people off here. You were seeing Fang just drop ridiculously low at the end of it. Uh, or sorry, he actually is running Incarn. Sorry, he's not running Cultivation. So, which... I also really don't like being able to do because it sets you so far back for the rest of the storms that you're dealing with, especially when you're expecting to get three storms at least. Uh, to be. So at this point, you're getting, you're not getting that kind of bounce back mechanic. You're not getting an empowered by Ganeer. You're not getting, you know, the huge, the big flourish with germ and cultivation always added into it. And I really would have been interested in seeing if he was going to run Sefus and maybe try to get the roots out onto some of those yeah. as you see on the right side of your screen to further empower his hots. So it seems like he's going to be in a pretty uh, troubling situation going into this storm right here. And they are ending up popping bloodlust here. Yeah, they don't have the forgive me buttons essentially that you could potentially have there, but we are seeing them do relatively well so far. Yeah, I think that the bloodlust is absolutely necessary here to make sure they're able to stabilize and get everybody topped off to make sure they're surviving through this storm because 24 tyrannical and while the explosive in the volcanic isn't too big here just that big damage and also being forced to top somebody off right before uh the big hits happen is so necessary and thankfully darkness was there to be able to help yeah, them out as well death on the side of shell's angels this one going to be a little bit less costly obviously the five seconds are going to matter but 
Fenrir is at 1%, so they should be able to clean it up there. And I'm assuming that the the, the Fallen will just, uh, the Departed are probably going to release here and actually run back on their own path. But this is one of the places where you kind of lose time by going for Fenrir first. One of the things that you're going to notice, these players are going to be on their mounts. They're not actually going to have that speed buff. You get that from downing Persia first. So this was one of the reasons they kept kind of trying to bring up, look, it's going to be a little bit slower. This is where they are going to lose time. They went for the safer play, though. They wanted to have those battle res but they get costed by having their Druid go down early on the side of Skyline D. Yes, they did have to use that heroism, but they have been able to deal with it. Herja about to drop down for Skyline D, and you gotta say, it looks like they have the lead. Zero deaths so far. Now they're going to be able to move on to Fenrir's room, and when they get Fenrir down, they will have that speed buff. They are going to be able to just zoom right out of that room, get on over to the bridge, and deal with the final two bosses. Skyline D doing a fantastic job here they are rewarded for that risk yeah, and it also shows ju just a better preparation in many ways that they have had this is almost an entirely different team from what we've seen in arcway really oh in entirely and this is also one of the reasons when shells angels did pull fenrir i was like well, or even when they pulled the trash on that side of the room i'm like jack why are they going for this why are they doing this that little speed buff can be a huge thing as far as the pathing is concerned and it really did come down to what you said they, they wanted to have battle rests and things like that but you can see the pressure is on for shells angels they know that they're going slow here they're going to go for that big pull everything gets line of sighted gets pulled into that room they're not going to be able to keep it into that beam for very long already one death going to be coming out they need to get out of dodge here they're going to try to tuck it back into a corner another line of sight they need to get away from those explosive orbs as well and not only that but the mystics they're actually two holy radiance cast that went through from the mystics almost topping off the entire team here they're still not quite out of range of uh the thunder callers you've seen doro of course getting taken down there so this looks to be a, a little bit of a throw on their side where they just weren't able to have a very strong execute going out from it you are seeing sierra drop very low as doro is down sierra is down as well looks like they, they will be just that full team wipe as they weren't really able to execute as well as they were hoping for and if they're going to drag everything all the way back I mean, they can, but the amount of, you know, time lost and the amount of additional deaths they're going to incur if they prolong this pull is just going to be ridiculous. I gave Shell's Angels a lot of credit, even in some of the wipes that they did have in the last dungeon. They looked like calculated decisions. They looked like high percentage plays. At this point, they're playing scared, and they're honestly not playing nearly as well as they did in their first dungeon. And this seems like a clear opportunity for Skyline D to not have the sun set on them like it did last time. It was not pretty. We saw Shell's Angels pull ahead by a full boss and 2%. They were able to absolutely own in that first dungeon. Now Skyline D going to be moving to Fenrir, and they are going to have the advantage coming out from that boss. Shell's Angels needs to redo that pull after getting 11 deaths so far to the zero that Skyline D has. Yeah, it's very interesting as well, seeing the effect of the Sentinel, for example, preventing a lot of those ad casts from being interruptible. So when the Sentinel is just sitting right on top of everybody, it's providing a buff to all the, the uh, enemies and makes it so much harder to actually put together strong CC chains for the entire group. And the Mystics just topped everybody off. Those two casts just got out, of, got out of hand. They already lost DPS as they were trying to pull the rest of the pull together, pull the rest of the, the uh, trash together, get it all together and begin the uh, CCs. So at that point, it was just that bigger failure, and they're trying to get everybody back together, waiting for cooldowns before they can even start the next packs. And you get to see the moment-to-moment -moment decision making that they're actually having up on the main stage, right? You look at Shell's Angels, and they go, okay, we're behind. We need to go for a big pull is pretty much what that seemed like. Then they go for the big pull, and it doesn't work. They don't go, okay, let's go for the big pull again they go okay now let's play it safe so you just put yourself in a position where you took that that high risk and then you, you try to maybe not uh, operate off of sunk cost but at the same time you just put yourself so far behind i maybe even would have liked to see that big pull coming again try to see if they could execute it if they do want to catch up because now they do need to find something they do need to find a way to catch up 55 seconds behind not even including the fact that they're not even into the boss room and Fenrir's already at 70% for Skyline D getting pretty close to the portion where he's actually going to move over to the other side. We're going to see those ads come out. Keep in mind, that was one of the first big mistakes that we sh saw from Shell's Angels. They're going to have another couple of deaths come in here, but we saw their Druid go down 40% of boss health still up. That was really the first road bump.
And, and speaking of road bumps, you know, Shell's Angels is having all everybody dying but the tank at this point. Uh, very, very messy pulls coming out of here, and they're just trying to make sure they're able to get themselves reset and be able to take on, uh, get back into this, really. And they're going to need, you know, some substantial advantage or substantial mess ups on the side of Skyline D in order to get back to it. 15 deaths on the side of Shell's Angels compared to the zero on the side of Skyline D here. And Skyline D is just looking to be in such a powerful commanding position. I mean, to be frank, look, Shell's Angels last time, it was about as dominant as it could have gotten. Gotten. This time they're getting dangerously close to getting full screen. Skyline D going to be on Fenrir now on his second side. Let's see how they deal with these ads. We know that it can be something that is hard to deal with based off the fact that we saw the Druid go down even on the side of Shell's Angels. One of the nice things that you do have going for you is this three melee DPS composition going to deal with ads really well. You can put on that Demon Hunter Legendary is one option. They don't even need it at this point. They're going to be able to really focus their damage there. Not enough ads to really warrant it. And you can start to see the eye beams coming out here, but ultimately that damage all getting focused on to none other than Fenrir. Yeah, it really shows how they're able to help focus the damage, help tunnel the damage into it. And also, at this point, they really need to make sure they're perfecting their callouts. I think on the side of Shell's Angels, it was just a simple call-out mistake where it said, in counting on the Paladin to have less protection onto uh, Doru, he just didn't have it and they weren't able to actually react in time to it. You know, little things like that. And having that constant communication stream will be so important as Shell's Angels goes into Hirja here. But at this point, it's on Skyline D. It's their game to play, and, and they're in the driver's seat. And Shell's Angels, this is a boss that they respected so much that they did wait to pull it, right? And you talk about communication being absolute key. It is going to be an execution going to be key as well. We're getting close to the full screen, but ultimately Fenrir is going to be close to falling down on the side of Skyline D, and they're going to have that speed buff as well. Can't stress it enough. That actually is going to be a little bit of a factor that's just going to allow them to speed even more ahead here. Fenrir at 20%, and you can see just everybody doing massive amounts of damage. And looking at the other side, you can see just it almost looks like Shell's Angels may be shook at this point. We may start to see some simple mistakes come in even as they move forward. I think those small mistakes have really kind of compounded. I mean, at least when we were in Arcway, for example, they did have those extra deaths. They did have those wipes. There's a call, for example. They got all the mobs down. Going up to Evenir, for example, they got almost all the mobs down, and they just had to, you know, take care of the warp shades that were leading up to it. Uh, and so, but when you're going into these, they're keeping all the mobs up. They weren't actually able to kill everything all at once, and it sets them back even further and further. And at this point, Skyline D is... a full boss ahead of them and going to be moving on towards Skobald and cleaning up the last bit of trash. Tables have really turned, yeah. to, to be completely honest, in the series. And you bring up that first dungeon and you kept saying, uh, on the edge of a razor, I believe was the way that you were saying it, that was how those pulls went down. And we are going to see a death come in here in the final seconds. That is going to be the first death for them. Not too impactful there. Yeah, you don't need to get on your mount there, but they're going to be now zooming back on over and we are going to see Demon Hunter going to be able to run right back in. will be able to mount up from the beginning of the dungeon and get on over. I I, I think you really do have to say, though, this time on the other end for Shell's Angels, it hasn't been wipes like that. These wipes have been a little bit more coming down to mistakes. Hers are going to get pulled again. Yeah, and you know, Shell's Angels popping Bloodlust immediately uh, when they are uh, engaging with Hirsha here. Doro, of course, dropping very low from that first arc of light. Again, getting everybody in together, getting everyone in close to make sure that they're able to st you know, stay in close for Light of Dawn, as well as making sure that they're all going to be able to you know, quickly spread out and each have a pre-designated position of where they're going to spread out. That arcing light that comes out immediately after, of course, uh, the storm goes out. So as a paladin, you know, you're able to rely, and it syncs up perfectly, really, with Beacon of Virtue, and you're trying to top everybody off, and then watching target of target as to who is going to be hit by the arcing light immediately afterwards, and then dropping a big heal on them before it hits, and then topping them off. And you have plenty of time to top them off afterwards. In, in situations like this, I usually like to ask you, because in Arcway, we saw it as well, where it was pretty much a full boss lead. Are there pressure points right now for Skyline D? Do you see any moments, any pulls, where white potential could come in enough to maybe equalize things? I think the biggest thing is going to be on Skobald, where you know that you will have that fell rush charge that deal is the AOE effect, and in a triple melee, it's very likely that it's going to be in melee quite frequently. So at that point, you want to see how mobile, how quick the reaction times of the melee composition for Skyline D will be. Uh, I don't think at this point that that's going to be the simple thing that will wipe them, but that is the biggest threat that we've seen. Yeah, I mean, you want to basically be sitting there going, okay, we got to wait for this moment to see if it is going to be enough, but Skyline D, it's looking like clear skies for them right 
right now as they start to pull these kings and they're not going to have too many problems with it right now we already did emphasize the fact that this is going to be a dungeon where the bosses are going to be the most scary Hersia in particular a very scary moment here and once again we're seeing a yo-yo happen on their druid now it's going to be their monk they're not out of this one yet they need to be getting out of the way of this sanctify out of these fidget spinners and when the Sanctify goes down, of course, you will be blasted back onto the other side, leading up to the following storm. And this is one of the scariest positions, I think, for a healer, because you're having Expel Lights going out onto the rest of the group. The entire group needs to be topped off without using Virtue, getting everybody into a favorable enough position so that they can survive the storm. You have some opportunities if you wanted to proc Sefus off some of the mobs with maybe a Repentance, if you have it available to you, to be able to get the haste increase to quickly top everybody off. But you also have to make sure your positioning is going to be strong enough, especially if you're the last target of Expel Light, to be able to be away from everybody, get in, leave them down. You actually are seeing the Arcing Light cleaving onto two targets. Thankfully, Sierra did an excellent job keeping everybody topped off and doing a great job mixing, uh, you know, Holy Event and Tears Deliverance versus using wings for some of the storms and mixing those up and splitting them. It's important to be thinking about all those little things that you can do, and especially when you talk about Sierra. Sierra's positioning going to be absolutely crucial here, not only because of the mechanics, but because of the legendaries that you are going to be wearing and the fact that there are ads that are actually out of this fight that you can kind of jump over to and get that effect going off of your legendary. Give yourself that haste buff. But Sierra was one of the ones that we noted, even on Hamdahl, Jack, a few needless deaths coming in from Sierra. Have you seen Sierra's play clean up a little bit as we've progressed through this dungeon, even though we have seen 15 deaths on the side of Shell's Angels? Oh, through this dungeon, without a doubt, it's definitely you know raised the level we were kind of seeing from him earlier. And that's ideally where you want to get, uh, where you want them to be at every single moment of the dungeon here. So at this point, they're just now taking down, the Skyline D is just now taking down the last of the Kings. You probably will see Shell's Angels maybe grab a brew and then be able to stealth on by or uh, move on by M maybe even just having the pallet and just using bubble or just quickly snatching them up before he just ends up dying and maybe piloting himself to be able to rejoin the team here we're gonna have to see how they do actually decide to deal with it that looks like it was going to be a pylon coming down so they're gonna go for the pylon play that will get those ads out of the way we should see the paladin go down in a few seconds and then is he out of range of the pylon did he just he's out of range of the pylon oh here. My it's actually a disastrous situation because they oh. will actually have to have Doro go back oh no he got it he got he did it. it he did all right it. Oh, so i was worried about is the aoe knockback from the sentinel connect i saw no, it did connect it yeah. did connect but it looks like just by a hair we are going to see that pylon work that would have just been the worst uh, day ever a that's about the worst day you could have at the office, but ultimately there for Shell's Angels. Their strategy is going to work out just fine. Still, though, full boss uh, behind. More so than that, they still need to get all four of the Kings dealt with as Skyline D gonna pull Skull Vault and instantly gonna pop that Bloodlust. Big damage gonna be coming out for them here. Already noted on Skull Vault, due to the fact that they are stacked so heavily with melee, this is one of the most crucial moments for them here. If they don't have a white here, they start to get in some really safe, clear waters. And already, it's a pretty bright, sunny day for them, but it is going to be absolutely beautiful if they can make it through Skull Vault without seeing any deaths incurred. Yeah, and really they've done an excellent job as you're seeing Fang who's actually just uh, fell rushing out to dodge the, the fell rush from the boss, making it a lot easier for the rest of his melee to rely and count on, you know, your other melee counterparts to get out of the group. But also it says if one person messes up, we all could die from this. We all could uh, receive the same threat. So Shell's Angels also grabbing uh, the brew from, of course, the, the hall that we they had previously cleared out. They were able to actually throw it onto another king, so that way they're actually activating two kings at once. Uh, and they're doing an excellent job being able to get that extra cleave damage onto it while kiting away from any of these extra mobs that could be healing them. I really do want to commend, commend on the side of Skyline D how much of a, a turn of the tables it really is. They're pretty much a wipe away and a full boss away for on the side of Shell's Angels because yes, they they have the 16 seconds. That's that's 75 seconds because it's only one death on the side of Skyline D. You could basically wipe, run back, and pull before the kings come down on the side of Shell's Angels. So Skyline D really is in a fantastic position here. I think it's safe to say, and we're in Halls of Valor, it's going to be ages before we see Shell's Angels catch up to them. And ideally, you know, it's going to be pumping out as much damage onto these kings to be able to try to get in a position to at least try to catch up if there is any kind of error on the side of Skyline D. But they've just been playing so cleanly, and their execution has been phenomenal going into this instance. And, I, you know, a lot of times you'll see triple melee as, you know, one of the less favorable compositions going into it. But throughout this entire tournament, Skyline D has not shied away from heavy melee comps, has not really shied away from, you know, less conventional, less Western uh, compositions. And it, it's been working for them, as you're seeing right now. And that you didn't 
like the 4 DPS, but maybe we <laughs> see it again. Maybe we see it again. It looks like Skyline D is just getting slowly closer and closer to extending this to a third game. And if we do get to a third game, I honestly couldn't be more excited. You, you look at the first map, Shell's Angels goes for these high risk plays that look like high percentage plays. In the second map, they somewhat fall apart. Skyline D incredibly sloppy in the first map. In the second one, they look like a new squad. And you know, a lot of that, like, Jack, I'll, I'll say, healers, healers are good. <laughs> healers are extremely this is good. is crazy, man. I'm, healers I'm, are good. <laughs> I'm going to save this for posterity. Now, and, but it also does, like you said, you know, if they're extending it to a third map, what is it going to be on the side of Shell's Angels to kind of best counter it? I mean, not many people are usually counterpicking Sea of the Triumvirate, for example, but when you're forcing, you know, a three melee composition and there's no way that you're going to be able to do 40 DPS and Sea of the Triumvirate, where you're saying having that Boomkin is going to be excellent to be able to deal with so many different, uh, not only trash packs, but also, the, you know, dealing with Saprish halfway through the instance. You have some advantages there to kind of warm up and get uh, quite an extension there. I don't want to encourage that idea at all. No, it's really? Seed of the Triumvirate, but I will say with this composition as well, not only is the Moonkin good because it has multi-dotting, it's going to be able to get on tentacles. It, it, every single boss, they seem advantage because even on the final boss, having two monks, the amount of burst damage that they're able to get out is actually really important. So you're able to get through those phases much more painlessly. It seems like it could be a good counter pick, but one thing that I do want to note on the side of Shell's Angels, the first dungeon that we see them on, we assume that that's one of the most prepared dungeons, even as prepared as potentially your counter comp. There's a lot of stress on that first map. So when we see those risky plays coming out of Shell's Angels, we expect to see risky plays like that potentially coming out in the third dungeon as well. The question is, are they going to be rewarded this time around, or will they get slightly punished like last time? Skyline D pretty much gave it to him without a healer. I'm expecting that we do not see the four DPS as much as I would I would love to see that. I would like to see that even more than Seed of the Triumvirate. I would love to see four DPS again. But healing has looked like something that you should probably try to have in your party after seeing how good Skyline D has looked this time around. They are already on the final boss while Scoville's going to be in the 50% area on the side of Shell's Angels. That's not even including the 75 per, uh, 75 second excuse me, jump that we are going to have on the side of Skyline D. And we also know Odin, he's one of those bosses that just likes to play around. He doesn't need to get all the way down to that 0% health mark. Correct, you are, and you always have to be dealing with the obliterator that does just spawn here. He does pull Odin does pull everybody into uh, the melee right underneath him, which is where he will end up pulsing the entire group uh, that does get affected by it. So very important to make sure that you're using immunities, make sure that you're going to be able to uh, or stand out of that effect, and make sure you're still getting the kicks out onto the obliterator by casting that surge. It will continue to cast it, deal more damage, and cast faster if the cast does end up completing. And then at that point, you're making sure you're dodging the spears that are appearing, spawning uh, extra orbs and then, of course, connecting your colors to be able to receive a massive damage buff. It's big damage time right now. It's always fun getting to see two Demon Hunters do two different things. We ultimately saw two of the DPS getting to stay in in that, that, that major area of effect damage spell that Odin does put out. But now everybody is going to have that damage buff, and you can see it on the damage meter. A little bit of chunk damage coming out, but this is something that they are ready for, going to be able to heal everyone back up. And they're cruising through this boss right now, and it is all up to them. All they have to do, they could do this at a snail's pace. They would still be able to win bring it to a game number three and they're trying to do that right now this time they want to get out of that circle on the floor that ring of death and you can see demon hunters having phenomenal mobility can fell rush out of there even after staying in being a little bit greedy getting some of that extra damage with the buff yeah, right, at, right now at this point, they're getting closer and closer to that 80% mark, doing a great job being able to deal with the obliterator there. And at this point, it's just making sure you're dodging. You're going to be getting into, of course, your buff zones very quickly and easily. Shell's Angels just now taking down Skovald here. You're seeing Doru actually trying to get the disengage off. He wasn't quite quick enough there with his wild charge, uh, so he actually did end up going down there. They are able to expend the battle res, but they're, at this point, getting lost back. They're going to need a miracle to be able to catch it back up to Skyline. Yeah, because this is kind of the easy part <laughs> of the fight. After you do get that second buff you're, you're pretty much just looking at the health bar and you're just having a field day getting out all the damage that you can making sure that you don't stand in anything too bad here now we are going to see another uh, obliterator that you do need to make sure you deal with but at this point you just run out next time you connect it should be gg it is going to be the rogue staying in for a little bit longer having that defensive utility to use there, getting to be a little bit greedier and you can see because of that the rogue going to jump up to first place on the dps board for just a little bit here but now just two percent left for odin it is a thick 2% though because health bar is going to be a little bit larger to deal with the fact that it is only 20% that you need to do but now we're in the 1% range going to be able to get these buffs up soon 
Get a little bit sloppy there for a second, but finally <laughs> Odin will fall before he is even pulled on the side of Shell's Angels. And be successful. All right, it's going to be Fortified, Quaking, Raging, and the winner is going to BlizzCon. Will it be the Chinese team, Skyline D? Will it be the European team, Shell's Angels? Rich, Jack, show us our futures. Who's going to be able to get that first seat to BlizzCon? Very exciting stuff coming out here, and also we get to kick it off with a bang. You noted, yes, we got to go kind of slow on the trash. This is not the instance for that. Pull everything. Let's see how big these teams can go. This is one place where Skyline D in particular can really shine. Already we're going to see Zira get spiked for a second. Skyline D already inside of that bloodlust. We are going to see those demon hunters just having a field day with the mean beams. Yeah, right there. And you're also seeing just huge damage that gets put onto the tanks from that dark crash. That it really deals so much damage. You're trying to do whatever you can to keep Divine Field alive. As Shell's Angels opted to skip the bloodlust here and actually pulled it off phenomenally well, not losing out on any deaths or anything here. Skyline D, of course, mopping up their trash packs a little bit faster and working on to some of the buoys that they have going out right there. But at this point, Shell's Angels' execution was phenomenal, especially in Fortified Quaking Raging, which can be so lethal to the uh, tank. On top of that, this is really one of those moments that uh, he this is when Skyline D can really shine in this dungeon, and now they're in a scenario where they're going to have deaths co coming out after they're still kind of cleaning things up here. So now they're going to have two deaths against them. They're going to have a lower trash percentage already. They haven't pulled the boss. This is scary for Skyline D. This is the place where you need to see them be really perfect because there are multiple scenarios where you want to be multi-dotting in this dungeon. They're not going to be able to do that. And their burst coming into the, the final boss isn't going to be nearly as good as Shell's Angels, who are already working on the first boss. And their ability to almost effort effortlessly control a lot of the GUIs that are coming out from this boss, right? You will be having to deal with a fixate as one player, as you're seeing Harrow on the side of Shell's Angels is going down to be able to kill a bunch of adds. You will have just one non-healer character uh, be selected for it, while the, the uh, boss, Raw will then just fixate targets. If he hits any of those little GUIs, he will just pulse tons of damage here. So again, when the Harrow gets out of that phase, it puts a huge vulnerability debuff onto Zeral here. Uh, Shell's Angels does an excellent job controlling all these extra mobs, being able to funnel them into more single target damage. You're already seeing 20 percent left on Zeral and falling fast as they still have another 20 seconds left of Bloodlust to be able to just completely neutralize this boss on a 24. This is obviously rehearsed by Shell's Angels. They do the first pull very well without the Bloodlust. Then they go into the boss. They may get this down before Lust even falls they off. Will. It's absolutely beautiful on the side of them. And I would argue that this is probably the boss that they're the least advantage. Yes, they do have an advantage on this boss as well, but moving further into the dungeon, even when we get on to the next fight, they're just gonna, their, their advantage is going to increase, Jack. The snowball's just gonna keep on going, and if you don't feel confident coming out of that, dealing with Fortified, Quaking, Raging, your tank does not die, nor proc Purgatory on the very first pull. You obliterate Zoral. If you don't feel confident about this, if they're not high-fiving each other as they're waiting for the rest of the RP, I don't know what will get them there. <laughs> yeah, this is probably the one period where you can take your hand off the mouse and, and start getting those high fives going start getting the, the magic going a couple of fist bumps here as they do wait to get into this room move forward into seat and get those pulls going getting over closing all of those rifts but one thing that we need to start to think about as we start to move into the next portions one thing that can get a little bit tricky one thing that can throw any group off kilter is bumping into one of those tricksters when you don't want to yeah and that'll, that'll be one of the scary positions but also showing the discipline of the team you know a lot of times the tricksters are these invisible mobs that will kind of skulk around a lot of the roadside areas and having the predictability is where you don't know exactly where they're, you're gonna they're gonna go you can use demon hunter spectral site for example to find them if you have it but the consistency there where you have an approximate situation an approximate guess of where they're going to spawn allow your tank to move ahead and be able to kind of bait them out and bait them out to attack you that way they're not gonna be jumping on any of your more, more vulnerable players that's what you want to be able to see and showing you know how strong this team really is on a map that many people are afraid of it's the jump scare from the tricksters though right they're, they're really only scary when they pop out they're going to be able to do a massive amount of damage to whoever they do hit first after the tank picks them up you're pretty much out of it they're just for, for the most part just a regular ad that you don't have to be super scared of but it is when they come out of that stealth when you first encounter them where they're going to do the major amounts of damage now it is going to be skyline d only just now hitting that 10 percent mark it appears that they are going to have the the debuff now on to the boss they're going to be able to delete him in no time but they are getting far behind this actually 
could be, Jack, the most dominant performance in a series where we saw both of these teams have a moment where they're over a full boss ahead of the other squad. Yeah, and they have a lot of work to do first. As you see on the side of Shell's Angels, uh, taking on the second Rift Warden. When you enter this courtyard area, you will have to close three rifts uh, to, and in order to do so, killing the Warden. So what you'll see a lot of times is that consistent route that will come up. The first one's right in front of you, the second one to the right, and as you're seeing it with the team right here with Shell's Angels. And the one further will be out uh, no, more towards the temple. Uh, so in this area, it's just working on your consistency, and they already actually ended up pulling the trickster there. He actually had great positioning uh, on the side of Divine Field to be able to run out, grab, you know, the approximate area where the trickster was and immediately ran to him, and they were able to quickly get it into the group uh, before it actually ended up hitting any of the healers or DPS. So great moves by them, and they're already, you know, at the second Rift Warden getting it down before Skyline D even gets out of the gate. That also shows how well rehearsed that they are on this map, because if you have a feel for where the trickster is, that means that you are pretty much... I feel like that is a pretty clear indicator that they're pretty much running this at the same time every time that they're running it. That basically says that, okay, we are always at minute 30 of pulling when we get to the second Rift Warden, or we're at actually here would be like five minutes, 18 seconds, because, because of how those tricksters actually do move around the map. And like I said, this kind of control, this instance really just controls Shell's Angel's worst ambitions, right? When they want to play that hyper-aggressive, they are forced by the instance to not be able to do that realistically and consistently enough, right? I mean, this this really could have been the chance of saying, oh, we, we actually take care of these mobs 70% of the time. We take care of these poles in Arcway 70% of the time. You know, they go up against, you know, the minority situations, they start falling behind here, you know. And when it keeps on compounding or when the tilt kind of sets in, picking something like seat is just amazing for consistency. I also think that they're, they're just showing, like, did you see what they it did just, there it, for the trickster? Why they, they dropped D&D? &D. It's, it's phenomenal how he drops D&D. &D. They know that they need to get it there because they don't want any DPS to run into it. And knowing that it is in that area, because when they got the other trickster, they're able to get it on the path. They go, guys, we're going perfectly to script here. I'm going to pull this. I'm going to LOS it. We're going to get the trickster. And then we don't need to worry. They're probably on a field day now. I'm pretty sure if you get both of those tricksters out, you don't need to deal with the third one. It depends on which path they actually do take. But they know. It doesn't matter if we know. They do know. And you talk about how this dungeon forces them to be in a scenario where they can't necessarily go for the playstyle that seems favored for them, which is this all-in, essentially, strategy. These massive pulls, these high percentage plays, which they've been punished for so far in this series. They're really good at this style as well. They are very calculated. They've been playing this dungeon beautifully. Now, this is going to be one of those big pulls for them. Yeah, and especially in a situation where I don't want to say you would have no choice in routes, but they're a lot more clear-cut and they're a lot more decisive than other instances here. The uh, the ability to kind of lose out on some choice as you're pulling it, as we're seeing, you know, almost globally having a lot of the very same routing uh, that you'll see on even live servers here, allows them to drill down onto execution, perfect the execution, and make sure they're getting these good results. And this is usually going to be one of the biggest polls we're really going to see. It also puts them in a situation here, though, where they want to make sure that they really are staying on script, because they want to know exactly where those tricksters are are going to be. If a wipe does happen, all of a sudden they don't really know where the tricksters are and things like that. So very impressed by the side of Shell's Angels. And you know, this, I, I've, I've said it before, this is not my favorite dungeon because all the time, it's it's tough dungeon to do. It it's a very scary dungeon. And I, I feel like a lot of people do find themselves in that scenario where this is a dungeon that they're really scared of. This has been an absolute joy to watch seeing how Shell's Angels do it. One of the interesting things though is the timing of when this dungeon was released. Bear in mind that a lot of the other dungeons uh, that we have online servers everyone was kind of forced to do them more or less for for gearing or with exactly. essences or anything else there was incentives to do it in game and to steadily learn them uh once seat came out if you weren't doing it on mythic plus uh you know just doing it on mythic zero was not nearly as good of gear as you would see from uh just doing raids or anything like that so i think there is that kind of predisposition towards loathing the dungeon or being afraid of the dungeon but when you're seeing a team like shell's angels diving in and embracing it that just makes for them to be so much more consistent and in many ways superior to other teams. It shows, the, it shows the tournament practice instead of the, the real live practice, right? For for live, you don't need to practice this dungeon as much, much. It seems very difficult because you don't have the practice. I'm sure a lot of people watching right now are going, how are they making it look so easy? It's because of the knowledge that they are really bringing here. And we talk about situations where Shell's Angels can really pull ahead in this dungeon. This is one of them. Already, they're going to be working here on Saprish, and you can see the Moonkin is having a field day. This is the first instance of the multi-dotting going absolutely crazy. We're going to see it again on the next boss. Yep, the Saprish, of course, is going to be uh, a boss you know, three parts that all share a health pool, so multi-dotting is amazing for this encounter. You are going to have Saprish, the main boss, who will periodically just have a rush, 
uh, mechanic that will just deal a bit of damage and increase his own for every target he runs through. He will also periodically drop those traps, which will stun you and can be dispelled. Then you're going to have the Dark Fang, which is just the cat that will kind of jump out and have a small frontal cone. Every time you get hit by that, it will increase the damage you take from it. And then finally, Shade Wing will kind of jump out to one of the ranged players and start and start up a cast that will be a mass disorient. So it's very important in that vein to make sure that you're getting a consistent kick out onto it while moving everybody in a group away from any of the traps here and maintaining a tight clump and stack for the melee and making it easy for Multidotti. All of those things absolutely crucial. And like you said, the positioning going to be important because of all those mechanics, but the positioning going to be great here for the Moonkin, able to dot up everything and delete all of it. Five million DPS coming out there. Skyline D, it almost seems like at this point that they're probably going to have to read the dungeon journal to double check all of those things because they are far behind from Shell's Angels here. And I'm really excited to see if we actually do see another trickster get baited out here for Shell's Angels. They're showing that dominance and they're using their full advantage from having a good first map pull. And we're going to get to see once again their composition being really strong on the third boss, but they got to deal with this trash first. Maybe you're seeing them walking that tightrope there, splitting the gap along that pathway. Very easy to actually end up pulling anything extra here. This is actually an incredibly big pull. They're pulling the Grand Shadow Weaver, which has almost an explosive orb on steroids here uh, in terms of the dark matter that he will spawn uh, periodically that must be neutralized immediately. Uh, you have a very short duration to be able to kill it. They just do such an excellent job being able to get that collapse uh, cast interrupted by destroying it. But then you also have to worry about any of the draw-ins, any of the vacuums that will come out as you're seeing it uh, going on to uh, Ashen right there, making sure they're able to get him topped off, and it will just put out an AoE explosion at the end of it. This is an excellent pull here. They're doing a great job taking care of that dark uh, dark matter from the Grand Shadow Weaver. And that's, that's the last mob remaining. And that was a really aggressive pull that I wasn't expecting them to go after. That is a very tough pull. I mean, that's honestly, that is one of the pulls where, you know, you you're, don't do you're it. doing this with friends. Yeah, you, <laughs> you don't do it because if you did do it, it was probably a mistake and you were probably going to wipe. And then you go, okay, guys, we depleted again. Let, let's, let's get ready to do that one uh, next week. But ultimately here, Shell's Angels are going to be going ahead and getting over onto this boss. This is where we said they had a huge advantage. It looks like they're going to finish up their supper first, maybe pull a little bit more of this trash. But Shell's Angels here so far ahead. And this is probably, with the tentacles that are going to be coming up on the next boss, Jack, this is another opportunity for them to widen that gap. Yeah, and really showing as they're just kind of mopping up the rest of the trash. That, uh, Sierra did an excellent job actually finding uh, the trickster there, getting a quick stun on him and uh, yeah. alerting the tank. It was such a quick reaction time uh, before he got too much damage onto him. And again, just that consistent powerhouse. And Sierra has done an excellent job when he had that gigantic pull of keeping everybody alive oh in one of the darkest situations. That was kind of the thing that we saw from Sierra too. It was like Divine Field's going to drop the D&Ds to try to find the trickster. And then if the trickster isn't found, Sierra would run, look for it, because Sierra said, okay, I'm actually actually waiting for the trickster. It's not going to sneak up on any of the DPS. And then Divine Field, you can go ahead and pull it off. But now we are going to see Viceroy being pulled and you are going to see these additional ads being spawned. This is the opportunity where we say that a Moonkin is going to be very handy, but it is going to be none other than the monks who are going to be world starring Viceroy right now. Before Skyline D, they're at actually the same percentage here on the boss. It's going to be a whole boss back, but they are both in that 60 four percent range right now on their respective bosses yep and right here for viceroy the, periodically there will be three tentacles going out uh, that they need to be able to take and having an excellent bird's eye view to be able to see where they are spawning at and, and then you will be having as we're seeing right there perfect timing as the void benders are coming out which will shield the viceroy as the viceroy begins to have that eternal twilight that nuke cast that kills everybody if it's not interrupted they do a great job stacking those shadow vendors together getting out the uh, quick interrupt uh, just before it ends and then continuing on. It's the just the little things, too, that have been so phenomenal to watch. Even on the DPS side, like, you see those benders get grouped up and instantly it's a full moon coming down. Little things like that where they're min-maxing their damage. They're saving everything for those moments. It is going to optimize their damage, but it's also going to put it in the areas where it is the most important. So phenomenal by every single person on Shell's Angels. They're just executing everything flawlessly, and you can see why this is their pick. And you could see almost when we were in that first dungeon, we were saying, you can see how close it is to working. You can see that there is a clear strategy here. You can see it actually working this time, and the <laughs> reward is nuts. That's right. And in many cases, they are taking, uh, you know, higher probability chances. Uh, and, you know, 
lesser risks than they've taken in other dungeons because that's just how this dungeon ends up working. You are seeing Doru going down because he was ending up getting uh, double tentacles onto him. They weren't quite able to kind of DPS it down. And that's always the gamble as a healer is, can I contribute? I know I can contribute tons of damage. You're seeing almost 900k oh, off at a zero. No! But they weren't actually able to get the Void Bender uh, interrupted in time and they just get a full wipe here. What did they actually try to do for the interrupt? Because you can see that that beam they, goes down. But They spent so much time actually working onto the tentacles and didn't collapse back onto the Void Bender that they just didn't get the cast uh, interrupted in time there. So uh, I know we've been really hyping them up and propping them up. That's really not what you want to be able to see here. That is why this dungeon is so scary, too. And ultimately, maybe if you don't see that death come in because of those two tentacles, it's a whole different thing. But oh, now Skyline D has their opportunity. This is their opening. They are still very far behind, but... This is the opportunity that they needed to at least get back on the right track. You can see they finally do get down their boss, but it's going to be an instant pull on the side of Shell's Angels. And remember that Shell's Angels, the way that they did this pull was nuts. We talk about, for the most part, that they're showing a lot of discipline, showing a lot of restraint. Well, they went ham when it did come to this pull. So we're going to have to see if Skyline D can make up time with something like that. If they can, maybe we start to see a game on our hands, but Viceroy already going to be pulled here from Shell's Angels. If they keep their spirits high, we already saw that they dealt with a lot of these mechanics flawlessly. It was that overlap of the tentacles that became a problem. Yeah, and they, now at this point, you know, as they're stacking up for the Entropic Force, it's going to be the knockback, which will be gradually increasing in strength here. They want to make sure that they're, you know, adjusting to what that is, but also kind of just shaking off, uh, you know, some of the pain there. This has been the only real error that we've seen out of the team thus far, so it's very important to make sure that, hey, we didn't even pop bother popping Bloodlust. We will have our cooldowns back very soon. One of the best things about Monks. And, of course, being able to get, you know, all the tentacles taken get down again. At this point, they're making sure they're getting that hard focus from all the DPSers as Sierra just takes down the last tentacle, making sure that they're, you know, getting the Void Benders down again. And again, now that they have have all this time available to them. I think it is just organizing their interrupts properly to make sure that they don't have that uh, that little mistake again. That really is kind of the best thing about Mux, though, isn't it? It's either you're in cooldown or your cooldowns are off cooldown <laughs> soon, trademark. But now we are going to see that they got to deal with this boss yet again. Skyline D still dealing with some of the trash that you highlighted as being some of the most dangerous trash. We got to keep our eyes on the 15 seconds, yes, but really it is going to be oh, Skyline D going to have that other death. I knew that there was something wrong there. <laughs> that is going to be them incurring another death. And Skyline D, ultimately, this was the pressure point. This is where they needed to come out of the gates really hot. This is going to be scary for them. It, once again, is going to be on Shell's Angels here to just get this boss down without another death. Yeah, right here, they actually have phenomenal uh, tentacle spawns here. Everything extremely close together here, uh, right as the Void Benders are coming out. So very important to be able to just quickly get the tentacles down if you can, switch targets and be able to neutralize them rapidly. And here you are, just make sure that they have the kicks properly organized to get them at the very last second there going out there with the solar beam, cutting it as close as possible, you know, which will then prevent more ads, spawn, ads from spawning or tentacles from spawning and just allow you to get more damage funneled into the boss there. Yeah, beautiful stuff coming out, and, and it's good to see that Shell's Angels aren't caught on tilt after they do wipe there because they had such a flawless run they can afford that mistake and skyline d you know a few seconds ago said look they have a death it turned into two it turned into eventually six so they have a full team wipe coming in here ultimately now they're going to have to go about the rest of that trash yet again as viceroy is about to fall on the side of shell's angels yeah, right now they, they do have a little bit of time to be able to, you know, get all their cooldowns back, take care of a little bit of any trash percentage. I don't think that they need any, uh, they should be able to get the last 7% uh, as they're going into Lura's room here with the last two uh, Rift Wardens going out there. At this point, you know, they just need to be able to kind of reassure themselves. When I mean, you do have these kind of like waiting periods where you're just dying to be able to get back into the boss and be able to deal with it rapidly, that's, that's where you're really looking to say, all right, let's make sure we collect ourselves here. Lura's going to be an incredibly long boss, but we've shown already off Zeral how rapid Rapidly, we can pump out the burst damage when we need to. Yeah, and the other thing that I do want to note, too, from Shell's Angels, there's a bit of a fulcrum shift going on here as we see Skyline D dying yet again. Will it be a full wipe will be the question, but there's a fulcrum shift right now. We kept saying how the Moonkin multi-dotting was their biggest strength as far as their composition went on a bunch of the fights leading up to now. Now it is going to be the explosive damage out of the monks as we see a big pull coming on here. Yeah, and really, the standard Rift Warden pull that you have to do uh, to or in order to actually spawn Lura and actually activate Lura uh, will be going pretty basic here. They will periodically have a bunch of little ads out. But what they did was so important. They actually dragged the Rift Warden ads onto the stage 
where Lure is at. It then actually activates the boss fight and then resets the boss fight. That way they'll be able to instantly be able to actually uh, get the boss, skip any RP that is related once the Refordans die. The second the Refordans die, they're immediately able to engage the boss as we go full screen. That cheeky little play gets them out of that RP. You basically get to get out of one of the RPs, and it also warrants the first full screen that we have seen so far at the LAN. Shell's Angels in a dominating lead. I believe we saw almost 10 deaths on the other side, so that's an additional four, which is gonna put them behind, and a boss separating them. That's after a wipe that we saw from Shell's Angels. Now, it is all on the squad on your screen. This is all they need. This boss, they do it clean, they go straight to BlizzCon, but we know that this one is pretty terrifying, to be completely honest. Oh, without a doubt, and you're seeing Seer actually grabbing that last GUI that they have to watch out for to get the remaining percent. We will get you guys the final timing, of course, uh, from you know these runs right at the end. We actually just had a little bit of an error here. But I like what they're saying. They're actually getting the CCs out onto that little Void Discharge. That way, they'll be able to get it when they need to. But at this point, they are just starting Lura, which will start with one Rift Warden spawning, which again, just like the Trash, will periodically spawn a little bit of smaller as they have to worry about. The Rift Warden then will spawn just an Annihilate-like mechanic from Kill Jaden, which needs to be soaked by one individual, dealing quite a bit of damage to them, but if it's not soaked, it will just absolutely obliterate the entire party. Once that Rift Warden goes down, you will get another small round of voids coming up, and then you'll enter the vulnerability phase for Lura to be able to put out such huge damage. It's insane how good this comp really is for it. I mean, you even see when those little adds are spawned, they're instantly able to get out damage from the Moonkin. Now it is going to be on the side of those monks to do massive amounts of burst. Now that we are going to see Laura vulnerable, and look at that, Laura is absolutely melting here inside of the heroism. Big burst comes out, they get her down to 50%. I love having the Bloodlust on the first uh, vulnerability phase there. It really allows you to actually switch gears and get big damage onto the Rift Wardens immediately after after the vulnerability phase ends. If you chose instead to actually pop Bloodlust right when the Rift Wardens come out, if you kill the Rift Wardens faster than Bloodlust duration, you actually have to kind of sit on your hands for almost 10 to 15 seconds as you're waiting for vulnerability to start with Lura again, and by that time, Bloodlust just falls off. If you get Bloodlust off early into the vulnerability phase, then you're able to push it into the Greater Rift Wardens until they're almost about half HP onto them. They did a great job focusing one, so they only have to deal with the Annihilate that Divine Fuel is soaking up right now. It just makes it such a powerful move. By the way. It's powerful. You get maximum uptime, and it's also safe, like you said. I mean, you're going to have it for the full duration of that first phase that you have on the boss, and you are going to have it for the ad. So it really does work very well, and I think we've criticized teams for that in the past, maybe not using it there. It works very well for them as they pull all these ads over to Laura, waiting for that vulnerability phase to start again. Last time, they were able to do 48% damage with a crazy amount of burst and heroism. Let's see what they can do this time. It looks like they will be able to get very, very far. Laura already down to that 20% mark, and now the dance is going to begin. Yeah, and at this point, they're getting everybody tightly stacked together in melee, except for Doru here, because at this point, you're going to be having all of the goo that's on the ground right now, picking itself up and moving it right on top of their position, so you're able to kind of ping-pong back and forth from two set locations here. 13% left onto Lura, and it, at this point, you don't really need to have Doru stacked up with the rest of the group if he wants to be able to get a little bit more space to get casts off, and of course, getting a distance away from everyone else for quaking and at that point you're able to just drag in that last void discharge here make sure you're getting some cleave damage onto it Sierra at this point while low on mana is you know having his wings up keeping those consistent light at dawns and and playing very safely is just what he needs to do at this point in order to wrap up this series definitely the place you want to be as a moon kid but Laura with one percent now dropping shells angels going to be taking that first that first spot at BlizzCon and we can see skyline D still going to be working on Viceroy at this point. GG's on the side of Shell's Angels. That is one of the most coveted things that you can grab at this tournament. And now they can take a sigh of relief and you can hear them in the back right now reveling in that moment. Viceroy gave just a little bit of a scare at the end there, but the lead was already so uh, cemented that Skyline D unfortunately unable to capitalize. We saw them at the end kind of doing exactly what they've done all day, which is slow and steady, slow and steady. But at this point, Shell's Angel was able to execute on the map they picked. Uh, there were no grievous errors there, save that one Viceroy hiccup, but again, the lead was... That's right, thank you very much, guys. And congratulations, of course, Shell's Angels is able to take the victory and qualify themselves to BlizzCon. So, you know, I was gonna ask you later, but actually I'm just gonna ask you that to start things off. How does it feel? Now you've qualified to BlizzCon, that has to be an amazing feeling. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we're all here. You know, the, the, the goal in regionals was to get the globals, and then the second they announced BlizzCon, we just went, that. we, we want to go. That's why we're here, and I mean, yeah. I Speechless. Speechless. <laughs> and actually, I think your first con BlizzCon as well, right? Yeah, it's going to be. I don't think anyone's attended BlizzCon, actually, so it's going to be uh, an incredible experience for everybody. Awesome, phenomenal. Uh, so I just actually wanted to ask a question about Arcway at the very beginning. Obviously, um, all the you know other things that are going on. There's so many questions to ask, but obviously you guys had one or two intentional wipes going on at the very beginning. But then there was maybe a little bit of sloppiness at the beginning. What was kind of going through your minds, and how did you kind of keep composure when you're going into a very important match? I, you you just need to stay focused. You know, at, at some points things go wrong, and that that's wow, that's mythic plus. You know, not everything goes perfectly. The ability of a good team, like what I feel like we have here, is to be able to recover from those and be able to pull it back. And yeah, as you say, some were intentional, some weren't. But we we got to the end. We killed all the bosses. That that's the goal. We did it. So <laughs> yeah. Fair play. Well, thank you very much, my friend. And once again, congratulations being able to advance on. And we are done here. Let's head over back to the desk. Gotta be honest, a little jealous I'm not on the desk for this one because I think this is uh, just going to be absolute haymakers exchange. Yeah, it's really going to be a, maybe a clash of the titans, really. You're going up against the defending champions versus the pride of NA that has been working so hard to be able to get to this point here. And Method in general has fielded two extremely powerful teams here that are really not going to be satisfied with anything less than a BlizzCon visit. I think Free Marcy, too, you have to note 